Matthew 28, Jesus speaking, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In all four Gospels, we see this event. And Jesus is, is obviously praying for and preparing for what is to come in his life. And he knows it's in front of him. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's in the Garden on the Mount of Olives. And the name Gethsemane means olive press or oil press. And I think it would be an understatement that Jesus was being pressed and squeezed in this garden. And Luke's account of this event stresses and shows the anxiety and even goes to the point of saying Jesus was sweating blood. And I'm not going to get into all the specifics. Dr. Dan can do that at a different time, maybe, but... Jesus saying again, my father, in Matthew 28, in that Matthew 28, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And I'll read this, and I've read it over the years, as many of you have, and it's almost like we're in such an intimate, intimate moment. It's almost like we shouldn't be in that moment with them. That this moment is so rich and so deep and so heart-wrenching in some ways that Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father, are having this conversation, and I don't really feel like at times I should be sitting in on that. That's how deep this is. But aren't you glad it's included? <laughs> aren't you glad that's included? Because there's a possibility you've been in the garden of Gethsemane in this sense. You've been in the pressing. You've been in the sorrow. You've asked, Lord, or Stephen said, Lord, you could take this. We pray it all the time. I pray it, I pray it when I pray for healing. Lord, I pray for healing because I know you can. I don't know that you will in the way that I would classify healing, but I know you can. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night but I find no rest. The people of God, I'm just going to guess because it's still being done today, even by me personally, I know along the way, this has been said, whether by these words exactly or not, have been said so many times over the centuries. I can almost guarantee you you've done it somewhere along the way, most of you. If you haven't, it's coming. And if you haven't, it's because you've backed away from what God has taken you through. You just run from it. This bewilderment of God, where are you? I'm in my darkest moment. Where are you? Is God displeased with me? Is he pruning me? What are you doing right now? <laughs> it's confusing. It's crushing. And if you're not careful, it can lead to this overwhelming feeling of abandonment by God. I want you to hear me, please. These feelings should not be minimized by other people. 
Now, yes, we can over we can over emotionalize anything. Amen. But I think the day and age of just get over it, we need to be really careful with that. And there may be things we have to get over. I get that. But like I've told you before, I, I, I was raised by a man, an awesome father, and to this day I would say that unequivocally. But in this sense... He was also in a generation where he dealt with PTSD. And it was just get over it. Go home. We're shipping you home. You've been in the hospital for 14 months. I get it. I know you've been on the battlefield and saw thousands. You've, you've, you've zipped up hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of body bags. But we're going to ship you back to Granite, Arkansas, and just get over it. Matter of fact, it's not even going to be a hero's welcome. They're going to put you off on a bus in that little town on, while you're still on crutches, and you're going to have to go two miles on crutches home. Even your own family's not there waiting on you. But you've got to get over it. Just get over it. But aren't you glad Psalm 22 is also heard? As we read in Matthew 27 and Matthew, Mark 15, it's not up on the screen, but you know the words. Jesus on the cross. There was darkness all over the land. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yes, there's the sermon behind that would make a lot more sense. I get it, but I want to say he was crying out. I hope those words give us a little bit of hope that if Jesus experienced it, he understands where we've been, he understands where we are, he understands where we need to get to, that should give us some comfort when we hit the wall. So as we continue our series in the wall, Today, it's letting go, dot, 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 of my will. Letting go. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, I'm not even going to read it this morning. I've read it many weeks, but it's our theme verse for this series and that is God wants us to mature. And the only way we can mature is go through the stages we need to get to, to mature. That's what the word means, of perfection. We've got to go through the stages to get there. And see, we see throughout Scripture, Old Testament through New Testament, that the people of God face trials. And I would say the word, the dark night of the soul or the valley of the shadow of death, you can use that term however you want to. You can find your own term. But any, any of you who've been through the dark night of the soul, you know exactly what that is. We're going to talk about it a little more today. And some of these dark nights of the soul can last, last for 24, 48 hours. Something that's been in my life, my experience, they can last for weeks. They can last for months, literally for months. And I'd say in Scripture, sometimes it seems like they can last for years. My first qualification of that term, dark night of the soul, and most of you know me well enough, Know this, I was 26 years being a Christian before I ever went through one. 26 years, you would think by that point I was mature enough I wouldn't go through them, right? I'd already dealt with everything. I'd already processed enough at 26 years. But February 16, 17, 2012, I went through my first dark night of the soul. And that was only about a 48-hour window. I've gone through four more since then. 
And they were not 48 hours. Some of them up to months at a time. Peter Cesaro says in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which many of you know that's the, or you should know if you're, if you're here often, you know that's what we've been using as our basis uh, and, and loosely using as our basis for this series. But he says, not understanding that the concept of going to the wall and not understanding God's nature results in a great long-term pain and confusion. And he goes on to say, he said, the disorientation in pain of your present stance blinds you. So you're in the middle of it, and if you don't understand the nature of God, what he made allow to happen, if you, don't, if, you don't, if you start trying to figure it out in the moment, and you don't have enough recognition to say, I get, I know what I'm going through. I don't know how to get through it. I don't know why I'm here, but at least I know what I'm going through. There's a name for it. There's a way to put some thought around it. We've talked about it with the stages, like I said, with, with and it's again, I'm, telos or perfect or the word means going through the appropriate stages to a, a completion. Well, our completion won't be till we see Jesus face to face. We're transformed and we're being transformed. But I use this, many of you have seen this before, the Steve Meeks uh, version of stages. And I just want to give, because it's a real quick one. I don't know if we have it up there or not, but the four stages where there's the initiation stage of coming to know Christ, almost this euphoric stage of going, wow, I've got freedom in this. I didn't know this. I feel the lifting of, of, of my sins. I feel the lifting of, I'm now in a community of people, and it's so connecting. Then all of a sudden, if, as we go along, and it could be sooner than later, it could be way later, but there ends up being this alienation stage where you realize the people you're around are not perfect people. And some of the practices you put into place don't answer all the questions you need answered. And you could have done like me where I just began to ask more questions and begin to research. And so I didn't go through this, this long period of a dark night of the soul because I just kept asking questions. Ended up leaving from the Baptist church where I, we ended up leaving. Ended up the Nazarene church and we went a lot of journeying in between there looking, going to different churches. But that was, a, that was a hunger for me. So it was pulling me forward. But I wasn't really hitting the wall. But what happens to many people, if they don't do that, they end up in that alienation stage. And they, if they're not careful... You can go backwards in your faith, or you just go to a different church. And you jump from church to church. And you stay there long enough to find out those people are not perfect either. See, God wants us there. He just doesn't want us to stay there. Because he wants to move us to the transformation stage. Ultimately, he wants us to move us to the incarnation stage. Is with Jesus with skin on. There is a huge difference, and I want to make sure you understand this. Everybody, every day, I'm guessing, but I say this, we all have trials. We all have challenges. I don't want to confuse this with that. Okay, we all run into things that we wish, we run into annoyances. How many have any annoyances? How many have really have a, certain annoyances? I got one major one. And I don't know why, have you ever disproportionately reacted to something that annoys you? You go, why does that, why? For some people, don't even annoy them at all. Mine is people and you see, and I think our devotional, one of my devotional, one of our devotionals for uncommon, but my annoyance is people merging onto traffic that's going 65 or 75 and they're driving 40 and 45. First off, you're going to get me hurt. You're going to get somebody out there hurt. So me, there is a justification like I'm trying to save lives. Okay. But why do you not speed up enough to get in the lane with everybody else? Doesn't make any sense. It's an annoyance for me. 
a quick trial in my life. But then there's trials and troubles and challenges that take a little longer and we have to work through them. But they're not necessarily a dark night of the soul. So, so don't try. But on the flip side of that, to try to talk your way out of a dark night of the soul and say it's not anything major and I'm just going to move on is just as dangerous. You know, a phrase we've picked up here recently that I love, we just, you know, sometimes we just try to talk our way out of it. And I've said this, you can't talk your way out of what you behaved your way into. You can only behave your way out of what you talk, behaved your way into. If it's a behavior issue for the dark night of the soul, it could be different reasons why you're there. Some of it has nothing to do with anything you did wrong. It could be other circumstances happening to you. But when you hit the wall, it begins to turn your world upside down. We would talk about it a little bit in Uncommons, game changers, things of that nature. Could be that. Doesn't always have to be that level. A game changer doesn't. It could be from a death to career change to health diagnosis to a church experience, just like Steve Meeks talks about in alienation or betrayal. Possibly it's just a bunch of things piling up. <laughs> And you just never got one of them concluded, and they just keep piling, and here you are, see yourself underneath it. And you're frozen, and you can't move forward. You just can't move. And then other things begin to affect you. You begin to have this dryness, loss of joy. feeling of God's presence almost evaporates. You're bewildered, possibly angry, sad, forsaken. Most of all, you're just going to say, God, I don't know what you're doing right now. I don't know what you're doing. When we pray, we almost feel like the door of heaven has been shut. Shame, failure, regret, emptiness. One of the things you realize in the middle of all of it, you're not in control. Or you would control your way out of this. And you can't. And you know it. Wasn't that a sobering thing to some to come to the conclusion sometimes you're not in control? You almost come to the point realizing all the things I've done in my faith up to this point don't work for this. But one of the things for certain, and I believe, if you are facing the wall or the dark night of the soul, if you are, you can do a lot of things. You can try to go around it, try to go over it, try to go under it. But the only other way you'll ever have peace is go through it. Father, not my will. You could remove this, Lord. Here's the challenge that the church has run into over the years, and this thing is driving me crazy, so you know. This thing back around. Just talk amongst yourself for a second. <laughs> Boy, I wardrobe myself out here. It's pretty sad. The church hasn't had an answer for people how to go through it consecrate it Kurt 
Okay, I know I'm for that. But there may be more to it. If you're in Church of the Nazarene, at least at one time it was taught, and I've said this before, you get sanctified. Just stop doing all those things. And you'll be okay. And even taught at times, and I don't, I don't think that was our theology, sure wasn't Wesley's, is that the root of that is going, so you can't even sin again. Whoa. Experientially, that doesn't work, does it? Theologically, it doesn't. Experientially, it doesn't. But the worst thing it does, it paints you into the corner, and the paint won't dry. So even if I want to confess where I am, I can't come out of the corner because the paint's still wet. What are we doing? Let me be honest, folks. We hit the wall. And you could be 26 years in like I was, serving the Lord, loving the Lord, raising my family, trying to do, going on mission trips, doing all those other things. There's a lot of things from counseling, which I highly recommend if it's the right situation and with the right connection. Like I told you, when I finally got with my counselor, I went to one and I went to another one because I had to find the one, and especially the one I was with is a Christian counselor, which really helped me, and also was a former pastor, which even helped even more. There's other processes that we can talk about and help undermine, help reveal these things. Or we can just have people stuck at the wall. Just leave them stuck. A lot of times, and I want to talk about this because it's kind of been where I've been over the last three weeks, is part of it is, is God is purging. He's causing a purging happening in your life. Those who don't know, Jan and I closed on our house this Wednesday, and about 5 o'clock Tuesday, I hit the wall, but I had to be out of the house by 9 or so on Wednesday, so I couldn't hit the wall. I had to go through the wall, okay? I have a picture of my garage, uh, just the garage, not the storage building, but the garage. Yeah, that was part of my wall, because <laughs> you get to this point, you don't know what to do with it. Going, I don't even know where this goes. I don't even know what, we, what are we doing with this stuff. What, I don't even know who, who oh, do we, yeah, what, I... One of the things, you can choose to move from house to house and just keep it all, and everything you collected at that house, just move it to the next house, or you can ask the question, why do we still have this? Right? You just ask the question, why do we still have this? What purpose? I brought stuff out that we haven't seen in 10 years. I'm not talking about family photos. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about furniture that I put. We hadn't seen it in 10 years. Then we still had to wrestle with, do we get rid of it or not? We hadn't seen it in 10 years. And then, so what we ended up, I, I think I told you, we, we, I think we got rid of probably 30 bags of trash, not counting other, I'm talking about big bags of trash. I'm not talking about these little white, the little white ones that we put in these containers. I'm talking about big bags of trash. You know where I take them, and look how much everybody else is purging, right? Let's go to the transfer station. You know, that's not all mine. First off, I just want to make sure of that. Have you ever been to the transfer station down 27th Avenue? It's an awesome experience. I'll take you anytime you want to go, but you got to bring your own water bill because I can't go anymore. <laughs> okay, got to bring your own water bill. But I love going there. It is an, it's an experience. You drive into this big old thing. It's showering down this water on you for whatever, I guess, to keep the dust down. It's just showering down on you. There's mud all over the floor. And these big old honking front-end loaders are just flying by you, pushing it all up and dumping it over here. Quite an experience. And then this is our storage unit. Okay, where's the storage unit? This is the current one we have right now. So it's, I got the biggest one, okay? It's a 10 by 20. Do you see how many storage units are going up around this city? We're not purging very well. Just 
This is what I've learned about purging over this last week, and I hope this may be some help to you. One is it has to be intentional. You don't purge accidentally. You do not purge accidentally. You have to make major decisions of whether you should continue to be attached to something. You have to ask hard questions. Why have we been attached to this so long? Purging is specific. In other words, you may throw away some furniture or give it away. We, or how many loads we take to Goodwill or somebody came, we just, just kept giving stuff away. And, 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 and you go, I'm not getting rid of all the furniture. I'm just going to be specific about which furniture I get rid of. I'm not getting rid of all my clothes. I'm just going to be specific about ones I no longer... So you have to be really specific about it. You don't just go, well, let's get rid of all their clothes. Let's start all over again. No, that's not, because you're going to need more later, right? And the thing is, what's crazy about this, and and, and I hope you connect this spiritually, is that you're not getting rid of everything, but sometimes what was really useful at one time no longer is useful. It was great for a previous time, but that time has passed. Take a picture of it and get rid of it. Keep the memory. Let the memory be you go. It's hard work and it's tiring, isn't it, Jan? Amen. Jan never says amen to me on anything I say. She didn't even say amen then. She was too tired. <laughs> it is hard work. For most people. I know some of you say, I'm just throwing this away, I'm throwing this away. But it's because you have no feelings. You have no empathy. That's why you're doing that. <laughs> so I'm not talking to you. I'm not, I'm not bringing you into the conversation, okay? Because you can just throw everything away. So you don't count. The other thing I needed is like when we brought the kids into it. You go, sometimes you have to bring a different outside perspective to ask the question, should I continue to carry this or not? Should I keep this or not? Do you want it? (laughs) Which sometimes is the case in that setting. In that setting. But do I need to keep it's the question. Do I need to keep moving from house to house? Or place to place? I think the hardest part, and this maybe wraps up all the other things I said, is just this whole concept of detaching. Peter Cesaro says in this book, he says, makes a statement, says that detachment is the greatest secret of interior peace. We most often don't realize how attached we are to something until God begins to remove it. The most, the more attached we are to the things of this world, the less intimate we are with God. Can we have things of this world without without being snared by the things of this world? Well, I think the answer is yes. But you will figure that out intentionally, specifically, not generally. Some of you need to attach from some memories. From a spiritual, you need to attach your unforgiveness and let it go. You need to attach from, there's all kinds of things we need to detach from. And we can talk about me moving boxes and trash and all that and laugh about it. And there is some humor to it. But the reality is when we begin to bring that over to our lives, it gets pretty serious pretty quick. I love what Thomas Merton says. He said, I "I wonder if there are 20 men alive in the world now who see things as they really are. That would mean that there are 20 men who are free, who are not dominated or influenced by attachment to any created thing or to their own selves or any gift of God. It's 
simplifying our lives, removing distractions. That's what God does when he comes sometimes to the wall and going, those things were fine till now, but they're no longer fine going where I'm taking you. If you don't want to go where I'm taking you, then you can stay here with the things you're attached to. But you won't be at peace. You may be indifferent to me, but you won't be at peace with me. Hey, write that down. I need to remember that. I just, I didn't have that in my notes. That's good. That's good preaching. As part of the learning, I appreciated Allie's message yesterday so much about grieving and gratitude and those, those things of just going. Part of it is beginning to grieve the fact, and back to what I said earlier, I'm not in control. I have limits. Some of you need to grieve the fact that you really do have limits. Let it go. Detach from it. You'll be happier for it. One of the things I've, I, I was telling this is just a little funny side note, I think. So my friend Van, those who know Van and Terry, hey guys, shout out to Van. He's going to be so happy when he hears this, uh, that I gave him a shout out. But he allowed us to use this, it was still allowing us to use this carport across the street to park my old truck, my old 03 truck, plus a trailer, plus some other stuff. Anyway, I hadn't got rid of everything yet, just so you know. But I keep going over to my old truck back and forth. been doing it since we closed on Wednesday almost every day back and forth. And I told Jan, I said, man, I said, it's just strange looking across the street and seeing other people at our house. I said, that's really strange to see cars over there, hear the little boys running out back, hear them laughing. I said, it's pretty strange. I said, but then it dawned on me, it's probably more strange them looking across the street and seeing me standing on the other side of the street still. (laughs) That's even a little more strange. (laughs) Sir, I thought you left. No, I'm still right over there, right there. (laughs) So I did text our new owner, hey, I'm going back and forth across, just so you know I'm not stalking you. Just want you to know my old truck's still over across the street. But it is hard to detach. But let me say this, letting go of my will. One of the things I'm coming to, and I thought I already knew it, Just embracing the mystery of God. And just embracing the fact that sometimes when He's taking us through a season to cleanse or purge us, He's also trying to infuse us with a greater purpose. No doubt I ask questions along the way How long is this going to last? Anybody ever done that? How long is this going to last? Surely it's almost over, whatever this is that I don't understand. But I also believe he's a loving father. He knows how much I can handle. God is far above my ways. I've just got to conclusion, come to the conclusion I'm okay with that. I agree with Peter when he says, I can honestly say the more I know about God, the less I know about him. God is the one who moves us through the wall. He will not move you around the wall. That'll be your choice. He will not move you over the wall. That is your choice. But he will go with you through the wall. I just think there's a greater understanding I have today of the holy unknowing or the mystery of God. Letting go. Of our will. To the guard of Gethsemane in the pressing. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. God's work is slow often, but it's deep. We 
We've said through this series that we're going to come to the wall. We will hit the wall. But we're going to try to help you go through the wall and to recognize the wall as you move forward. But hear me, please. When God brings us, allows us to come to a wall, it is for your transformation. And when you're changed, also everybody else benefits from that. I want to be in a church where people understand the wall. I want to be with a group of people. Like I've said before, I don't want to call you at 3 in the morning, I'm going through the wall, and you're giving me some cliche or platitudes. I don't need that. I don't need that. I need people who have gone to the wall, come through the wall, or are trying to go through the wall themselves at that moment, whatever that is. That's who I want to be around. Sure, I want to quit and run. Sure. Anybody anybody ever say that? I want to quit and run. I say it often, way more often than I should. But I also come back to the mystery of God that he is doing something in my life, in the people's lives. He's still active, and he loves me, and he knows what I can handle. My favorite scriptures is Josiah and them come as we go to communion. It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 22, and most of you know it's kind of our basis for uncommon. I'm going to close with this verse as we move transition to. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, and some are for common use. Those who cleanse, the literally the word is purged there, themselves from the latter, in other words, common things, things that have no value to specific, specifically, will be made instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good, good work. Useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Lord, I don't know what work you got ahead of me. I don't know. And if what I'm going through right now, what you're going through is preparation for that work, I want to be said of me, I'm useful to the master to do any good work. Amen? Amen. The purging comes. The cleansing comes uncommon purposes. Amen? Okay. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us. Give us a moment here just to reflect. Before I do that, just logistically, if you've not been here before, just so you know, we usually try to come down this section, come down this aisle, and return back this way. Same on this side. You come, the elements, they are, I think they're all gluten-free now just in case, and uh, you can partake of the elements when you get back to your seat as we sing, and you partake when you feel ready. I want to give us just a minute just to reflect on the purpose of what we're doing here now as a family, and I do see this as an intergenerational family event. Dinner on the grounds last week was awesome. This is so, so precious. That Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he gave us these examples of the bread and the blood, of the juice, of the work he was going to do with it for us, that he wrestled with. He wrestled with. Lord, if you could remove this, if I don't have to go through the wall, I'll choose another option. No, I'll do your will. as he hung on that cross and felt the abandonment, if you will, for our sins. He asked us to pause. He says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of what I have done. So let's take just a moment.
there's something coming to your mind right now that the Lord says it's time to detach from that. And Lord, I think about this if we cry out to you. Maybe there's some dark nights of the soul we avoid if we're willing to detach way before then. But you love us. You love us so much, as they all say, in the way we are, but too much to leave us that way. So, Lord, we come today, I hope, with open hands, open hearts, remembering what you have done for us. And the least we can do, I think the psalmist says in 119.6, I will thank you by living as I should in obedience, trusting you that even in the darkest times, your way is the way. Lord, let us seek help from people who can really help us. Let us not minimize things that shouldn't be minimized exaggerate things that shouldn't be exaggerated but Lord help us to discern to not think, take things forward to the next house if you will that need to be let go of today but bless this time around this table as your family comes in remembrance of what you have done for us we pray this in your name Jesus Amen Come as you feel led today.